analysis looking at how rising global temperatures are affecting sea turtle primary sex ratios and hatching success and I'll talk more about this in the latter half of the presentation but first of all I'm going to give you some background information on sea turtles. So just as an overview I'm going to talk about um, Archelong, the ancestor of sea turtles and then tell you about the different species of sea turtles in the world, conservation status, the distribution, habitat, uh, going to a bit about legislation in the UK, and then uh, sea turtles that are found around the UK and some news articles about that, the biology, life cycle, threats that these species face, um, explain about temperature dependent sex termination mechanism and what it is, and then go into my research about how global temperatures are affecting this. So Archelon was the ancestor to sea turtles. It's the genus of extinct sea turtles now. It was the largest sea turtle uh, ever documented. The fossils measures uh, 3.52 metres from head to tail, so it was huge. And there's mixed hypotheses whether this species was an omnivore or an obligate carnivore. So it was a uh, mixed research about the diet. So there are seven species of sea turtles in the world and the largest being the leatherback on the top left hand uh, corner of the slide on the top row. And um, this is the only species of soft shell sea turtle. The other six are all hard shells. So um, in the top row of the slide in the middle, we've got a loggerhead, which is the largest harsh, hard shell of the species. And on the top right, we've got the green sea turtle. In the middle of the slide, we've got the flat back, on the bottom left hand corner, we've got the Hawksbill sea turtle. In the middle bottom row, we've got the Olive Ridley. And in the bottom right, we've got the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. And going forward, I'm mainly going to talk about the top three species on the, on the slide. So the leatherback, the loggerhead and the green sea turtle, because this is what my research covered. So this, is, this infographic just shows you uh, like the size comparisons of the seven species. So you can see that a leatherback is the largest and then the Kemp's Ridley is the smallest species. And then just in the bottom left corner, you've got like a, a shadow of part of an Archelon just to see in comparison to Archelon how big the current species compared to their ancestor. So the conservation status of the leatherback um, according to the IUCN Red List, it's classified as vulnerable and the population trend is decreasing. And as you can see on the species range map where the species resides, so uh, in the, along the equator and then ranging towards each pole as well. Now, I don't expect everyone to take in all this information. I'm not going to read all the countries out, but it's just to show you that they visit um, a wide range of countries, that's where they can be found, and they're possibly extinct in Israel, so there is some extinction possibly occurring with these species. And just to say as well, in bold, the United Kingdom is highlighted because you, you can find leatherbacks um, in UK waters, typically in the summer months, um, because the main diet is jellyfish. Uh, so they, when the jellyfish population booms in the UK in the summer, the jelly the leatherbacks follow the jellyfish and they can be seen around UK waters. So looking at the loggerhead conservation status, uh, they're also classed as vulnerable and uh, the population trend is decreasing. And they also have um, identified extant resident ranges and breeding ranges. So all sea turtle species are migratory, but the loggerhead has specifically identified uh, breeding and resident ranges, whereas the other species, they haven't been identified as of yet on the IUCN Red List. And again, not expecting everyone to take all this information, just to show that they can be found in a wide range of country. They have a wide distribution range. And looking at green sea turtles, these are actually classified as endangered. Population trend is also decreasing. And they have um, a smaller range as compared to loggerheads or leatherbacks. As you can see in the southern hemisphere, their range doesn't extend as suddenly towards the poles. It's more around the equator. 
and again can be found in a wide range of countries but um, not the UK or oh, the leather back also possibly extinct in Israel and also some extinctions occurring uh, from the Cayman Islands and Mauritius According to IUCN, they're already extinct from those places. So some extinction is occurring, unfortunately. So looking at their habitat, um, they span a range of different habitat classifications from marine oceanic, so open water, which is about 200 metres deep in the epipelagic zone, typically. Um, marine intertidal, so looking at the sandy shoreline on their beaches. And that's because the nesting sites for females are on tropical sandy beaches. Um, marine, coastal or supratidal uh, only applies to the leatherback and the green out of the three species shown on the slide. And similarly for marine eritic, so over the continental shelf, um, this doesn't apply to leatherback. They prefer to stay in more open pelagic waters, um, but it does apply to the loggerhead and the green, like to come to like the seagrass beds, for the green sea turtles or the loggerheads looking at you know also seagrass beds but also coral reefs subtitle muddy habitats etc and foraging ranges and um, leatherbacks can extend into temperate and subpolar latitudes whereas greens remain close to the equator as i mentioned earlier on the slide so looking at legislation in the uk all seven species of sea turtles are protected in the uk um, the flatback and the olive ridley are only protected by the Wildlife and Countryside Act for 1981, um, which extends from zero to 12 nautical miles uh, into the ocean, whereas the other five species, so the loggerhead, the green sea turtles, hawksbills, the Kemp's ridley, and I'm missing one, leatherback, loggerhead, green, Kemp's Ridley and Flatback. No. Anyway, the other five, sorry, mine's just spaced, um, are also protected by the Conservation of Offshore Marine Habitats and Species Regulations 2017 and the Conservation of Habitats and Species Regulations. So on this slide, we can see that I'm not going to read everything out, but it's an offence to kill or injure, to take, to capture or to disturb sea turtles. So there are some protections in the UK, which is good. And looking at sea turtles in the news, so this Olive Ridley uh, sea turtle was found washed up on Anglesey in Wales in 2016. He was the first Olive Ridley to be recorded um, in UK waters. Um, she was thought to be female and needed veterinary attention because she thought it was thought that she was cold stunned, which is a hypothermic reaction to prolonged exposure to cold temperatures, as Olive Ridleys are usually found in warm tropical waters and don't normally extend more north in the, the southern, uh, the, so the south of the USA, so not, not usually past Florida. So it's very unusual that she was found in UK waters. Um, leatherbacks, as I said, can be found in summer months. Um, this one was washed ashore in Ceredigion in mid Wales in 2017. Um, and according to the news article as well, about 10 other leatherback turtles had also been found washed up. Um, two months in the two months prior to this article, so between like June and September 2017. The largest uh, leatherback ever found was in 1988, which was measured almost three meters. It was 2.91 meters from the tip of the beak over the carapace down to the tip of the tail, and it was found washed up in Northern Wales. Unfortunately, it was caught in a fishing line and drowned. Um, it's actually in the Guinness Book of World Records as weighing 961.1 kilograms and it's thought to be the largest ever and it's the largest ever on record. Uh, they did an autopsy and it was male, thought to be 100 years old and um, this is displayed at the National Museum in Cardiff which is the top picture on the slide of it being displayed there and the bottom picture on the slide is when the sea turtle was first brought to shore after being found in 1988. So just going over some biology of the species uh, using leatherbacks as an example specifically. So um, the carapace is what uh, the shell is called. So the carapace length typically 
<coughs> sorry, that should be 1.8 to 2.2 metres. A mass from 250 to 700 kilograms, so very heavy. Lifespan typically is 30 years. Um, Colour, the carapace is black with white splotches and the underside of the shell called the plastron is white with black splotches. They have um, great diving ability, can dive to a depth of 1,280 metres and dive duration typically lasts from 5 to 20 minutes, but the maximum recorded is 85 minutes. So leatherbacks are the largest sea turtle species. They have a soft shell, which is um, cartilage, made of cartilage-like uh, material with a continuous layer of rubbery integument over the top. And the carapace is raised into a series of seven longitudinal ridges, which increases their streamlined ability in hydro <coughs> and hydrodynamics. Um, sea turtles can hold their breath for up to seven hours um, obviously, that depends on activity, so the more active they are, the less time they can hold their breath. But if they're very inactive, as in if they're sleeping, they can hold their breath for up to seven hours. So looking at the life cycle, um, males spend all of their time in the water, they never return to land. But females during the nesting season will come to land um, and nest. They, they dig a nest with their flippers. Um, and they lay um, a clutch, which is uh, a series of eggs, which can range from 50 up to 200, depending on the species. So they lay up, up to 200 eggs at a time, and then they'll cover the nest with sand and try and hide, hide the nest by throwing sand every which way uh, to hide from predators. And then they return to the sea, and they can return to nest five to six times on average per nesting season, but can be anywhere up to 10 times. And the species um, exhibit no parental care. So once they lay their eggs, that's that's it for the mother, for, for their parental job. Um, the eggs incubate for a duration of 45 to 70 days. Um, average time is about 60 days. Um, after hatchling, after hatching, the babies, the, so the hatchlings emerge from the nest and usually um, it's synchronized. So they all emerge at once around the same time typically at night, but it can happen during the day, and they will um, crawl down the beach to the sea. And it's called um, like an emergence frenzy or a nesting frenzy where they all uh, have for 24 hours, they just swim. And they think it's be because um, there's a adaptation so they can swim past the reef where there's more predators and get into open water, they have more chance of survival. So the, the early years, uh, there's little knowledge about what happens in the early years because they're out at the open sea. There's not much research on them, but it's thought that after a maturation period of about 20 to 50 years, um, the turtles reach sexual maturity. They come closer to land, to the coastal areas, and then when it's breeding season, they, they mate in the water and then the females return to land and nest and the cycle begins again. So threats, so there's several different threats that affect sea turtles, um, one of them being light pollution. So hatchlings use moonlight to um, as a stimulus to direct them towards the ocean. But with lots of artificial light nowadays near beaches, like from bars or hotels or just street lights from the road nearby, it can confuse hatchlings and they actually move towards the artificial light. So closer inland and away from the sea which affects their chance of survival as there's more predators on land like birds or foxes, but also because of this 24 hour period once they've hatched that they use all their energy from the yolk to get them past the reef, the more time they spend on land, the less chance they have to, to do so to get past the reef and there's more chance of them getting eaten by a predator. Solid waste and plastic. So um, I mentioned that leatherbacks eat jellyfish, um, like a special, different piece of plastic and especially like plastic bags can mimic jellyfish, so they get ingested by accident and it can block up digestive tracts and stomachs and cause problems and eventually death. Also entanglement, lots of um, plastic waste or like discarded fishing nets that the animals get entangled in and as they breathe air, they can drown. Oil spills and chemical runoff um, pollutes the waters and the beaches, the nesting habitat have detrimental effects to their survival. Coastal development, so urbanisation and uh, expanding 
urbanised areas onto the sandy beach habitats and leaves less space for nesting. Some species are hunted for meat, um, particularly the green sea turtles, as they get um, quite large. In some countries, they're hunted um, for their meat. Um, the eggs and the shells, so some places the eggs can be valuable to be sold. And the shells, so particularly hawksbill sea turtles, the shell is deemed quite pretty. So some places capture sea turtles and carve off the shell and use them as uh, ornaments or to design jewellery and things like that to make accessories. Um, eggs, again, as I mentioned, eggs can be valuable um, to be sold as either like if it if it's um, unfertilised, if it's not viable egg, it can be sold as like an ornament or it can be eaten for food or sold as part of the illegal wildlife trade if it is viable. Um, also, bycatch. Um, sea turtles also eat fish and they can be tempted by baits or can be trapped in fishing nets and they, they are drowned. It's estimated that one in 1,000 hatchlings actually make it to adulthood, so that's a very low number of impacting their survival rates. Also, uh, the threat of climate change, which is different uh, aspects to it. So the sea level rise, which um, as sea levels rise, there's less beach space for nesting sites. There's also more chance of nest flooding um, if the nest is close to the closer to the tide line and can get covered when the tide comes in. And eggs are porous, so if they flow up with seawater, the embryo dies. Um, sea level rise and stronger storms will erode nesting beaches and destroy habitats. Um, changes to ocean currents affects prey availability, which affects some species more than others, as leatherbacks, for example, feed on jellyfish. They flow with the ocean currents and end up with in places they've never been before and different prey and might affect their survival. Ocean currents also um, potentially introduce sea turtles to new predators that are not adapted to escape from. Um, rising sea temperatures uh, affects the primary sex ratio and hatching success because they have a temperature dependent sex determination mechanism. So what does that mean? What is a temperature dependent sex determination mechanism? So it's where the temperature uh, of the nest determines the sex of the offspring, uh, which is different to genetic sex determination like we have, for example, where we have uh, chromosomes that determine the sex of the offspring at fertilization. Uh, with temperature dependent sex termination mechanism, it can, the, the sex is not decided until the pivotal temperature and the incubation temperature of the nest uh, is determined. So uh, there's different types. There's type 1A, 1B and type 2. So at type 1A, that is where at low temperatures, there's a greater proportion of males and at high temperatures, a greater proportion of females. And this is the mechanism that sea turtles use. Type 1B uh, is the opposite. So at low temperatures, it's a high number of females and at high temperatures, there's a high number of males. And with, this is used by Tuatara. And in type two, uh, which is adapted by crocodilians, it's kind of the intermediate temperature is where there's a high number of males and at the two extremes, so very low temperatures or very high temperatures, a high number of female offspring are produced. So the critical incubation period where this mechanism occurs is the middle third of the incubation period, which is called the thermosensitive period. And typically the sea turtle incubation, egg incubation period is about 60 days on average. So that means this period occurs from days 20 to 40 and embryonic stages 12 to 20. And the pivotal temperature in sea turtles ranges between 28 and 31 uh, degrees centigrade, depending on the species. It's a little bit different for each species, but it's within that range. So this leads me on to my uh, research, which was effect looking at how rising global temperatures affect the primary sex ratio and hatching success of the leatherback, loggerhead and green sea turtles. So uh, it's clearly, if you look at the graph, there's clearly an increase in the average global temperature. Um, then this is compared to the pre-industrial global temperature as a, as a baseline uh, since, since 1880. 
Um, this is due to carbon dioxide and methane emissions rising over the years. And there's been an average of 0 0.85 degrees C warming from, 18, eight, from 1980 sorry, to 2012, so a very short period of time. And average warming in 2020 was 1.02 degrees above pre-industrial times, and it's currently the warmest year on record. This affects sea turtles um, as higher incubation temperatures as a greater proportion of female hatchlings. So this skews the sex ratio and has further impact on population dynamics and further offspring produced in the future. As there's, if there's less males reaching adulthood, then there's less mating can occur and less genetic, di genetic diversity. Um, successful incubation temperatures are between 25 and 33 degrees C. Um, above this, there was high embryo mortality, which is a lower hatching success. So my um, research focused on two things, looking at the primary sex ratios and the hatching success of these of sea turtles. So I collected published data to perform statistical analysis to determine whether increasing global temperatures does affect these two things. And my hypotheses were as temperature increases, so does the percentage of female hatchlings. And the second hypothesis was as temperature increases, hatching success decreases. So I uh, searched through scientific literature and different uh, databases to just name a few, it was like Web of Science, Science Direct, Wiley, Just Store, etc. And found 17 studies for the female that provided results on percentage of female hatchlings and 12 studies providing information on hatching success. The data collection period was from 1954 to 2015, so over a large temporal range. I collected temperature data from um, NOAA and the, ideally I would have been able to gather very localised temperature data from the nesting beach where the, the primary sex ratio or the hatching data was collected. Unfortunately, not all papers um, provided this information and I wasn't able to find it anywhere else. The closest localised data to the nesting site I could find was uh, from NOAA, which was the annual mean land temperature for each continent or for America it was for each state. So this is the temperature data that I used. For data analysis, I used uh, general linear models to determine whether the primary sex ratios to different species were responding differently to temperature and also whether the primary sex ratios in different nesting locations responded differently to temperature. And similarly for hatching success, I was looking at whether the different species responded differently to temperature or in different locations responding differently to temperature. So this is just showing um, that the 17 studies I found for percentage of female hatchlings uh, were in 10 different countries. So we've got Brazil, Costa Rica, Cyprus. Well, sorry, 10 different locations because um, I split the states in the USA, the Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina states, but the rest of them are all countries like Greece, Turkey, Suriname, Taiwan, etc. Similarly, for hatching success, these were in seven different locations. Costa Rica, Cyprus, Florida in the USA, North Carolina, USA, Greece, Mexico, and Turkey. So what did I find? So did a uh, linear regression of a percentage of female hatchlings compared to temperature and found that the percentage of female hatchlings did significantly increase with temperature, but the R-squared value is low, indicating there's uh, a lot more variation in the data that this is not explained by temperature. As you can see, there's a wide range of points above and below the line of best fit. So looking at location, um, found that location does have a significant effect on the percentage of female hatchlings. 
um, but there was no significant interaction of temperature and location on percentage of female hatchlings, which indicates that the primary sex ratios for each location are not responding to temperature differently. Um, and just say that some locations were more researched than others and over a longer period of time, as denoted by the length of the GLM lines of best fit. Some of them are very long because they had data from uh, spanning several years, whereas some of them are very short because it was just maybe for one nesting season or just maybe two. So the, each uh, location is not researched equally. Looking at species, um, found that percentage of female hatchlings did increase with temperature, but didn't significantly differ between the three species. So it indicates that primary sex ratios for each species are not responding to temperature differently. So looking at hatching success and temperature, found that this hatching success did not decrease significantly with temperature. Um, and as you can see, the R squared value is very low. Um, so there's almost no correlation denoted on the graph. And found that looking at location, hatching success did decrease significantly with temperature uh, when location was considered in the model. As you can see, these, uh, particularly the one for Turkey, these lines of best fit are very different. Um, found that location has a significant effect on hatching success, which uh, indicates that the hatching success for each location is responding differently to temperature. So location does have a significant effect on hatching success. That's very interesting to find. And looking at species, um, hatching success did significantly differ between the three turtle species. But the relationship with temperature did not significantly differ between three turtle species. So it shows that even though hatching success did differ between the three species, it wasn't because of temperature. They were responding to temperature the same, so it, something else must be affecting the hatching success. So the, the percentage of female hatchings was found to significantly increase as temperature increases, which supports previous findings of other studies. And hatching success does not significantly decrease with temperature. Sorry, hatching success does not significantly decrease as temperature increases, which supports the findings of some studies. Um, it could be the case that the mortality rate temperature, so the temperature where higher mortality rates occur hasn't been reached yet, and that's why the significant effect of temperature on hatching success wasn't found in this study. Um, the low R squared value indicates a weak relationship. This could be because the temperature data used for the study um, is like the mean temp annual temperature for the whole continent or state. I think that if uh, more localised temperature data was used, different results possibly could have been found. Um, as I said, all locations were not studied equally, so more research is needed across different locations to have a more robust study. And it could be that um, something else is affecting the primary sex ratio, um, such as other factors of climate change, like increased rainfall, which has been found in other studies, such as Hawks et al. Um, I conducted this research between November 2016 and January 2017 um, as an assignment for university, as this was nearly five years ago now. It could be that um, more research has been done since and it'd be interesting to do the study again and see if different result is achieved. Also I think it'd be good to include grey literature so to contact um, sea turtle conservation NGOs who do nesting studies um, and ask if they would kindly provide their data incorporate that with the peer-reviewed literature and data and see how different the results could be. And does this research have implication and management strategies? So it suggested that nest shading could be incorporated. So um, covering the nest by having overstory vegetation uh, to reduce the amount of sun, the direct sunlight onto the sand. Um, 
but this has been found to keep nests significantly cooler than unshaded counterparts in hawksbill turtles. From Camel et al, 2013. Um, changing sand colour could help as lighter sand remains cooler. Um, moving eggs to cooler locations, either that being a different area of the beach or moving to a hatchery facility indoors with a controlled temperature. I just want to spend the last few minutes talking about uh, conservation efforts. Um, so different organisations are doing different conservation efforts, which can include protecting nesting beaches, like having signs up or having um, restricted like opening time to beaches as uh, sea turtles often come, nest, come onto land to nest at night. It could be that um, no one's allowed on the beach at night and have someone patrolling the area. Uh, moving nests if they're too close to uh, the tide line or if they're in the way of a known activity to move them to a more secluded area on the beach, the more protected. Um, could be that if the beach is very populated and the nest is definitely going to be disturbed, could move the eggs into an artificial hatchery facility. Um, awareness campaigns, so public engagement and education, making people aware of different uh, things they can do to help nesting sea turtles and how not to disturb them, etc. Uh, research into nesting studies, um, so which is what I looked through to do my systematic review, uh, adding more research to that cohort. And also migration studies, so recently I've seen a lot of um, studies where they've attached satellite tags to sea turtles to find out where they go because it could be that there's offshore habitats or habitats that we're unaware of um, that need protecting that's important to their development and reaching sexual maturity and overall their survival. Um, I mentioned that bycatch is an issue for sea turtles so there's been recent development in that area to create turtle excluder devices which is what this diagram on the slide is showing and it's basically there's like an escape hatch in the net but the sea turtle can escape through but the target catch is st still remains so the, uh, the fishermen still catch what they want to catch but reduced by catch of sea turtles and other animals can es that are not part of the ideal catch can escape this is just showing some key conservation organizations um, I'm sure there's many more. This is just a few to make you aware of. There's Arcolon in Greece is a big one. Um, Leatherback Trust in Costa Rica. There's uh, Love the Oceans in Mozambique. Uh, Madagascar Research Conservation Institute uh, in Madagascar. And there's Captain June Sea Turtle Conservation Foundation in Turkey. And all these are employing at least one, if not many more, of the conservation efforts I mentioned on the previous slide. So what can you do to help? Um, you not eat fish or only choose sustainably sourced, so like uh, MSC certified or ASC certified shellfish. Um, looking at the method of catch, so uh, me different methods of catch have different uh, bycatch percentages associated with them. So line and pole caught is deemed the best one because you're just catching the target species and nothing else. You can reduce plastic consumption so there's less going to the ocean, causing uh, less problems for wildlife. You can be aware when going abroad. So some um, hotels abroad, they gather uh, sea turtle hatchlings when they emerge from the nest to keep them in a bucket to show tourists. And this can be detrimental, um, as I mentioned before, the 24 hour period where they need to swim past the reef if they're kept in a bucket for the first day or so and then released they don't have the energy to swim past the reef and there's more chance of them being uh, eaten by predators you can spread awareness and uh, education is always a great tool to help what the others understand you can also volunteer so all the previous organizations have mentioned on the previous slide um, accept volunteers you can go and learn about sea turtles and help uh, help in their conservation efforts and also help gather data too because many of them also conduct research and just uh, the last point just if you want to stay in the know the state of the world sea turtles otherwise known as SWAT um, produce reports and you can subscribe to the uh, email newsletter to stay up to date 
on the cutting edge of sea turtle research or just learn a bit about more conservation efforts and what's going on in the sea turtle world. You can also follow sea turtle conservation organisations on social media and stay up to date that way. Um, thank you for listening. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Saskia. It was such a good presentation. Uh, there are a lot of rounds of applauses for you. Um, and we also have quite a few questions. So um, I can get started. And if anyone wants to ask their questions, uh, please feel free to add to the Jamboard, uh, which is linked above. So um, firstly, we have a few questions just relating to uh, general turtle morphology and kind of placement. So um, someone has asked if turtles, the turtles had a large range across different sea temperatures um, and what might the behavioural impact of this be upon turtles? So do they get slow in the cold, for example? Yes, so um, as I mentioned with the olive ridley that was found on um, in Wales in 2017, because olive ridleys are normally found very close to the equator and don't venture into the poles they um, are not adapted to the cold water, which is why she washed up on shore. She was um, cold stunned. She had gone into like a hypothermic state and she probably, she probably would have died without human intervention. Um, uh, on the other side of that, because the, the leatherback turtle has such uh, a broad range and does extend into, into the poles. So as I said, it comes around the UK during summer months. Um, it is adapted to colder temperatures. I'm just going to check my notes because I did have something written on that. Uh, just to give you more information. Yes, so cold water adaptation for the leatherback. Um, these adaptations allow them to both generate and retain body heat. Include so these adaptations include a large body size, and they can change swim swim activity and blood flow to help regulate the temperature. And they have a thick layer of fat to keep them warm in colder environments. Very cool. Um, so in relation to the Olive Ridley found in Wales, there's someone who has asked um, if you know if there's any reason why there have been so many strandings found in Wales. I'm not sure why Wales particularly. Um, in the news reports, it said that a lot of them washed up after a storm. So it could have been that the storm affected the sea currents and uh, basically took the, the turtles off course. And that's how they ended up around the UK. So basically, because of like um, changes in the weather and changes in the ocean currents affected the, the course. Uh, cool. Thank you. Um, so in terms of uh, sex determination, so uh, there's one question of how might the long lifetime of some turtles affect the impact of sex determination? Um, so right, I guess evolution in turtles takes some time. Yes. Yeah, so... I know that um, some species of reptiles do uh, can use like asexual reproduction, so parthenogenesis is where basically where the females don't need a male to reproduce. Um, and if the in sea turtles, because of rising global temperatures, they will reach a point where it is purely just females. Um, but be, you know, some people suggested, or maybe they can adapt parthenogenesis. But as they have such uh, long lifespans and it takes them a long time to reach sexual maturity etc I don't think there's enough uh, evolutionary time for them to adapt this b before the critical point reaches where it would need to be implemented if that makes any sense so I don't because they have such long generational times and reach a long time take a long time to reach sexual maturity that's not enough generational time for evolution to uh, occur for them to adapt their own asexual reproduction Thank you. Um, in terms of uh, the different locations studied, uh, so there's a question on if there are any potential reasons that you know of why turtles from different locations may respond to temperature differently. It could be due to the location. I honestly don't know. I'm just thinking ahead aloud now. It could be maybe some countries the nesting location is closer to the equator 
I don't know that'd be further research to be <laughs> to investigate <laughs> something for next time yeah. yeah there's also a few questions in relation to kind of that the habitats um, in which the nestings were observed so there's one question in terms of location of acting hatching success were the areas that you studied heavily polluted um, i.e used by tourists heavily um, if if you know of that um, yeah and I guess if that was factored into your study so I don't know off, off the top of my head I didn't factor that in uh, to my study but that would be interesting to know um, if any sort of pollution or human disturbance or any other external factors were affecting nesting they're definitely uh, very important something to look at in the future it's on the same note um but I, I guess it's something again for further research. Um, if you knew about the hatching sites um, and how predators might be in those areas and how that might influence uh, the study. So some um, papers did say that they protected nests by either having, um, I forgot exactly what it's called, it's kind of like a nesting cage to protect against predators getting into the nest, etc. Um, not all uh, papers said they did that uh, so it could be a discrepancy there but it would be interesting to see how external factors like predation does affect nesting and subsequently you know further survival of offspring thank you um so one big potential question um which is if you were to go back and do this project again uh, what would you do differently um, and which of the limitations do you think had the biggest impact on results? So I think one big limitation was like access to temperature data. Um, another one would be that I, as I was going through the different papers, I noticed there wasn't a standardised way of sexing the turtle offspring because they all look the same like morphologically especially when they're so so young it's only when they get older it's and they reach sexual maturity that males grow a longer tail um but even that is not always indicative because you can get a female with a longer tail so it's it's hard to just to sex them and there was different methods used and um, some studies uh did did a very invasive like laparoscopic um assessment and looked at for the for the gonads but you have to do that unfortunately when the hatchling is dead so they when because uh, not all sea turtles unfortunately um emerge from the nest some of them are dead so they looked at the dead ones and and, and determined the sex of those um, other studies had uh, temperature loggers in different areas of the nest like the top middle and bottom recording the temperature throughout the nesting Throughout, sorry, throughout the incubation period um, and they counted the number of eggs that were at the different levels and used the temperature as inference for uh, the sex of the offspring. Um, so it'd be good to see some sort of standardised methodology. Um, I did uh, see recently uh, that uh, TESAC 2020 has developed a new methodology to sex sea turtles um, that is not invasive, it's but it looks at the histology and identifies anti-malarian hormone, which basically males have, but females don't. So maybe moving forward, that could be uh, used more widely. Would that still involve being a little bit invasive in terms of, of swabbing or uh, getting samples? Yeah, and it'd be very labour intensive if you wanted to test all of the ones as, as I said, some some nests can have up to 200 eggs, and if they're all viable, that's 200 offspring just from one nest. So it, it's not necessarily feasible, but it could be that you take, uh, you, you combine approaches and do, like, you take a few from each level of the nest, like the top, middle and bottom, and maybe take samples from a few of those. Thank you so much for the presentation uh, once again. And... If anyone ever um, has any other questions that they didn't get a chance to ask during the presentation, um, if you just want to uh, send an email to the Science Talks inbox and we can forward it over to Saskia. Um, but just once again, uh, to give a round of applause to Saskia for her presentation today and thanks so much for uh, giving this to us. Thank you for having me.